I can say is, in Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe the words are on our wall here behind us. And you know what that phrase means? It means to logically form a conclusion or an opinion about something. I believe with all my heart that Jesus died and he rose again the third day and that his resurrection power is alive and at work because it is the most logical conclusion that you can possibly come to. This morning we heard four powerful testimonies. Weren't those testimonies amazing? Man, we heard from Haley who talked about being filled with pain and emptiness and experiencing everything that this world had to offer her. We heard from Dan about the fact that he thought he was free, but his freedom actually almost imprisoned him. His freedom almost destroyed his marriage. We heard from Chris, who lost her father at four. Just try to wrap your mind around that. Lost her father at four. Her husband betrayed her, abandoned her, left her with three children. We heard from Joash, who lost his brother just over a year ago. And do you know what makes Easter so special? Do you know what makes this the amazing day that it is? It is the fact that all four of them and hundreds of others that are gathered here today and myself included have all come to the logical conclusion that when you believe in the mighty name of Jesus, it changes everything. It's the most logical conclusion that you can come to. You can see the evidence of the power of God in changed lives. Hey, not perfect lives. We're always going to be imperfect. We are sinners, right? But you can see the change. You can see what God does when he gets a hold of a heart. And you yourself can know God personally. If you open your eyes to believe the truths that he unveils in this book right here. And if you claim the promises, he will prove himself to you true time and time again. The most logical conclusion you can come to is to believe In our risen Lord and Savior. The title of the message this morning is The Journey to Belief. Our passage tells a story about two unfamiliar followers of Jesus who are about to go on a journey from unbelief to belief. It's Sunday. It's the actual literal day that Jesus rose again from the grave about 2,000 years ago. And these men are leaving Jerusalem and they're traveling about seven or eight miles to a small village called Emmaus. The journey, probably depending on how fast they walked, would probably take somewhere between two to three hours. Well, while they are walking, they are talking. And I'm telling you what, these men are reeling. They are real. Their whole world had been turned upside down. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then three days earlier, he was crucified and put to death on the cross. I mean, their hopes and their dreams had been completely dashed. Now it was the third day. And some of the women that were in their company went to the tomb early. And when they got to the tomb, guess what? It was empty. And they were telling these reports about these two men who were angels that were there saying, he's not here because he is risen and he is alive. And some of the other men that were with him ran to the tomb and they discovered that it was empty, just like those ladies said. But what were they going to do with all of this? Nobody had seen Jesus yet, and they hadn't seen him. What were they going to do? Well, look at what happens in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 24. Y'all need to follow along because I'm going to have you help me out, okay? All right, so Luke 24, verse 15, it says this. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, everybody help me read this last part of the verse. What does it say? Jesus himself drew near and went with them. They're talking about Jesus and all the events that happened. And guess what? Jesus himself shows up and joins them on their journey. Now look at verse 16. You got to see this. It says, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They are literally on a trip with Jesus and they have no idea that it's Jesus who is in their presence. While they are talking with Jesus, there are three awesome questions that this passage reveals to us that we need to talk about today and discuss. And so let's just dive right into it. Here's question number one. Question number one is this. Where have you been? Where have you been? Let's look at verses 17 through 19 to see where this question comes from. Look what the Bible says in verse 17. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? He's like, what in the world are y'all talking about? 
I mean, he could visibly tell that they were reeling. He said, what's got you so upset? What's got you so sad? <laughs> Look at how they respond in verse 18. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him. Now, I told you that these disciples of Jesus were unfamiliar disciples. I don't know much about Cleopas, but this I know. He must be from the New York or New Jersey of Israel. Because he is about to respond with a pretty blunt, truthful answer. I mean, he's just going to lay it out on the line, all right? So look what he says. And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Like, where in the world have you been? Have you been living under a rock? I could just imagine Jesus looking back at him and being like, actually, it was a huge stone. That's where I've been. I mean, they're sitting there and they're just like, they're, they're just perplexed. How could you not know what is happening and what is transpiring? Well, Jesus, he's not playing along with them, but he asks another question because he's trying to bring to light the things that they already know inside. And he says in verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? And these men, they go on. I could read verses 19 through 24, but I want to tell you, these men, they go on and they say, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, mighty in word and in deed before God and all men. But our chief priests and our rulers, men, they have delivered him and condemned him to death. And they crucified him and were devastated because we truly believe that he was the Messiah, that he was going to be the one to redeem us from the land. But now he's dead. But guess what? Today's the third day. It's the third day, and some, some women from our company, they went to the tomb, and they found that his body was not there. And they said that there were some angels there that told him that he was alive, and other people went to check, and when they got to the tomb, it was empty. Jesus is not there. What in the world are we supposed to do with this? And then, by the way, where have you been? How do you not know any of these things that have happened concerning all the things that have taken place in Jerusalem? <laughs> They're talking to Jesus. Jesus didn't reply with this because they already knew it and it was going to eventually be refilled. But I could hear Seer Jesus saying, listen, I have always been. I am the creator of heaven and earth. I am your creator. Heaven is my home where I'm worshipped and adored, where I spend time with all of the angels. But about 33 years ago, I left heaven and I humbled myself and I became a man. And I was born in Bethlehem in a stable, and they laid me in a manger. I've lived a humble life the past two and a half years. I've been in Galilee, and I've been performing miracles, and I've been opening up the keys and the truth to God's word, and I have proven over and over again that I am who I say I am. But more recently, in just the past few days, I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I was praying in agony to my father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And I get up and I go to leave the garden and I'm met there by Judas, one of my closest followers, one of my closest disciples, and he betrays me with a kiss. Then I'm falsely accused. I've been beaten. I've been spit upon. I've had the beard plucked out of my face. I've been mocked and made fun of. I've had a crown of thorns shoved into my head. They took a whip, a leather whip that was shredded at the end that had sharp uh, pieces of glass on it. They took leather uh, balls and they took that whip 39 times and they literally ripped my back to smithereens. Then they forced me to carry my cross to Golgotha. They laid me down on that splintery wooden cross and they took great pig nails and they drove them into my hands and they took nails and they drove them into my feet and then they stood that cross up and it thudded into the ground and for six hours I hung on that cross in excruciating pain and agony. But you know what the worst part was? I became sin. A holy, righteous God, I became sin, and my father turned his back on me, and I cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then I gave up the ghost. I cried out, it is finished, and I breathed my last breath, and they took me off the cross, and they prepared my body, and they laid me in a cold, dark, borrowed tomb. But just this morning, the Holy Spirit of God showed up. 
Just this morning, he breathed life back into my body and into my soul, and death could not hold me, and the grave could not keep me, and that stone was rolled away, and I walked out of that grave, and I am here right now with you. That's where I've been. Will you praise the Lord this morning? I believe with all my heart that Jesus died. I believe that Jesus died. I believe that whenever we are reeling and desperately searching for answers, and listen, I don't, I don't know you this morning. I don't know your background. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what you've experienced. But I know who does. I know that God does. I'm sure that in this room, there's probably some people in here that have gone through horrific things, and you've even been at that point in your life where you're saying, God, if you're real, how could this have happened? And where were you when I really needed you in the deepest, darkest moments? Can I tell you this, that Jesus, even when you're crying out and questioning him, that he is there, he is right by your side, and if you could just open up your eyes, you would see his arms extended to you, and you would see the nail scars in his hands, and he would say, that's where I've been. I died the death that you deserve to die. He took my place. He was where I deserved to be. Do you understand about these men? These men knew all about Jesus with their heads, but they didn't get it. What we need, more than we need someone to fix our problems, more than we need someone to heal us, more than we need financial prosperity or a blessed life, more than we need any of those things, we need a Savior. Because we're sinners. If you come here today and you are broken, you are in the right crowd. This is a room that's filled with broken and perfect people. Don't let the clothes fool you. I think I look pretty good today. My wife got me all dressed. <laughs> Just kidding. Although I do think I look pretty good. No, I just <laughs> anyway, listen, don't let that fool you. There's not a facade. I hope that there's never a facade that believers put across. We are broken sinners in desperate need of the grace and mercy of God. And Jesus Christ, he died because the punishment for my sin was death and going to church and having a water baptism like Haley talked about and, uh, and doing good things to your neighbors and hoping that your good outweighs your bad when it's all said and done. Those things will never save you. Only what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, only that will save you. Somebody had to pay my penalty. Somebody had to take my place. And that person was Jesus. I believe Jesus died. The second question that I want to look at this morning is this. Wasn't this necessary? Wasn't this necessary? Look how Jesus responds to these two men after they said all these things. Look at verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? That's what he's saying. Wasn't this necessary? Wasn't it necessary for Christ to suffer and die so that he could enter into his glory? And then look at verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You want to talk about a master class of mesmerizing teaching that would hold your attention and your mind would not even wander for a single second. Imagine walking and spending two to three hours of Jesus where he opens up the Old Testament and he tells you all about how it points to him. That's what happened. I can imagine he probably went all the way back to the garden and he looked at those guys and he said, remember the garden? What happened in the garden with Adam and Eve? They sinned, right? God told them not to eat of the forbidden fruit, and they ate the forbidden fruit, and they sinned, and because they sinned, death passed upon all men. And remember why they sinned? Because there was a serpent that came along, and that serpent tempted them, and that serpent got them to, 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 uh, to not have faith in God and to believe that God was trying to hold back good things from them, and they ate of the forbidden fruit. Well, remember what God told that serpent? Remember when he came along and he said, hey, the rest of your life, you're going to crawl around on your belly. I can even imagine him saying this. And by the way, how do you kill a snake? What's the best way to get rid of a snake? Man, you take your heel 
and you shove that thing right down on his head and you stomp until there is no more life left in that snake. And can I tell you, serpent, one day there's going to be a seed that's going to come from, from the seed of a woman and he's going to be a man and he's going to be the innocent, perfect, sinless sacrifice, the lamb of God, and he's going to go to a cross. And yes, sin is going to bruise him, but he's going to rise again one day. And when he does, Satan, you are done. You are finished. It is over. Death has no more hold. Death has no more power. That's only three chapters into the Old Testament. I mean, that's just getting warmed up. I could sit here this morning. We could walk through the entire Old Testament. We could talk about the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We could talk about the Exodus and the Passover lamb and the parting of the Red Sea. We could talk about the manna that he fed them with every single day. We could talk about the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. We could talk about the tabernacle, the temple, the sacrifice, the feast. We could talk about the kingdom of David and the promise that God made to him that one day there would be a man that would come from his seed that would rule and reign on his throne forever. We could talk about how God's children, in spite of his goodness, failed him and sinned and messed up. And Jerusalem got destroyed and the temple got destroyed and they got led away into Babylonian captivity. We could talk about how the fact that God miraculously sent them back into the land and they rebuilt the walls and they rebuilt the temple. And Jesus Christ himself was in that temple just a few days earlier teaching and preaching. I could tell you the entire Old Testament points to Jesus Christ because it does. The Old Testament sets up the fact that Jesus is a better king. He sets up the fact that there are a blessed people. He sets up the fact that there is a broader land that flows with milk and honey and promises and the goodness of God galore. I believe it was necessary for him to die so that he could rise again from the grave so that he could enter into his glory, so that you and I can enter into his glory and spend all of eternity forever with God. I believe Jesus is alive. I believe Jesus is alive. Listen, do you understand this morning that Jesus is the better king? That all of you that put your faith and trust in Jesus, we are a blessed People, Do you understand that the kingdom of heaven is the promised land? Joash was exactly right. There's coming a day when he's going to see his brother again. There's coming a day where there's going to be no more sickness, sorrow, pain, tears, crying. He's going to make all things new. There's coming a day where the best part about it all is we get to be in the presence of Jesus, where there's fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. I believe Jesus is alive. And you know the best part? We don't have to wait. That new life begins now. Now, again, I'm not promising you that if you put your faith in Jesus, the prosperity gospel, you're going to be wealthy and wise and man, you're going to get bigger houses and lands. I'm not promising you that you're never going to have to go through cancer. I'm not promising you that you're not tragically going to lose your brother out of the middle of nowhere. No, there is pain and suffering in this life. But I am promising you this. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. His resurrection power is enough. It's enough It's enough to set you free from fear, from depression, from anxiety. It's enough to satisfy and fulfill the longings in your heart. I promise you this, Jesus will never let you down. He's a friend that sticketh better, sticketh closer than a brother. He's a father that will be faithful. He will never fail you. He will never leave you. He's everything that you're searching for. He's everything that you're looking for. I believe that he is alive and he wants you and he wants a relationship with you and he wants to do an incredible work of transformation in your life. And the last question is this. Did not our heart burn? They reached the end of their journey. Again, two to three hours with Jesus, opening up the scriptures, and Jesus, he starts saying goodbye. He's going to continue on, and these men, they don't want this to stop. They don't even know it's Jesus, but they know that something's happening inside of their heart, so they beg him. They're like, you can't go on. You, You need to eat. Come on in and and have dinner with us. So you know what Jesus does? He goes into the house. He sits down. The Bible tells us that he takes the bread and he blessed it. Maybe the moment of faith started coming when he started praying. Maybe the way that he said, Father, there's something so genuine and real and authentic about it. 
Maybe it's the words that he said, thank you for this bread, which gives us the strength that we need. Thank you for the way you sustain us in life. (laughs) Thank you for the way that you've provided every single thing that we need. Amen. And he opens up his eyes, and he breaks the bread, and he hands it out like this, and instantly their eyes were opened. It was Jesus right there in front of them, and instantly he was gone. Now, how many of you believe that was a meal unlike any other meal that you'd ever experience in your life? Look at how they respond. They respond in a pretty incredible way in verse 32. The Bible says, and they said one to another, what is that next phrase right there? Did, read it out loud with me. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Did not our hearts, those questions, the answers that we were looking for, he answered them all. The Bible is true. Jesus is who he said he is. And then their eyes were opened and they believed. Did not our hearts burn? Can I tell you this morning, the last practical application is this. I believe. And when I believe, I see. If you want to see, you have to believe. And the moment that you believe, your eyes will be opened and you will see life from a brand new perspective and in a whole new way. Hey, did not your heart burn this morning when you heard those testimonies? Man, my heart was burning inside of me at the goodness and mercy and grace of God, how it speaks to, it speaks to wherever you find yourself in life. Did your heart burn today as you thought about the pain and the suffering on the cross as his body was broken and his blood was shed, as he paid my sin penalty, does your heart burn when you think about Jesus and that sacrifice that he paid for you? And does your heart burn this morning with hope as you think about all the possibilities of your new life in him? There are endless possibilities. Does your heart burn with hope and desire to lift up the name of Jesus and to see him and to believe in him and to watch him transform whatever situation you find yourself in? Is your heart burning right now? Because you know that you are a sinner and you know that you need a savior. Do you see Jesus as the bread of life? See, there's so many people in this world that know all there is to know about Jesus. They got a lot of head knowledge. And when you came in this morning, this was, this was just bread. How often do we, I like bread. I like to have bread as part of my meal, part of my meal. I enjoy it. I think most people here do enjoy it. Bread's a huge part of our lives, but so often it's just a part of our life. It's not our life. It's not what sustains us. And this morning, you may have fond feelings of Jesus. You may think he's a a pretty good man, a great teacher, but is he your personal Lord and Savior? Have your eyes been opened to the fact that he is the very bread of life. He is the source of life, the source of strength. God provided everything that you need in a Savior and in a Lord through his son Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. Do you see him as the bread of life in your only way? 